Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel Callahan with Rapid Chatter here to talk about what happened for paleontology in August 2020. And let's get started. First, we're going to look at a letter that discusses one of the more controversial subjects of paleontology. Recently, we looked at what's happening with the Burmese amber coming out of Myanmar and the human rights violations that are associated with that amber. This letter essentially says, yeah, like it's terrible that these human rights violations are happening, but it's already out of the ground, so we might as well study it, which if I was these researchers, I would simply just not support a genocide. I know that might be controversial to say I don't support genocide, but it's something that I think these authors should do and all researchers in paleontology should take specific care not to do. To be clear, screw these authors, they suck. Moving on to the more scientific published papers now. So one of the important things when we look at fossils is how it directly interacts with human experience on the planet. And these are much more recent fossils and some of them are actually much more modern than fossils. And this is because we're looking at the thylacine or the Tasmanian tiger, which used to live in large parts of Australia and Tasmania. The thylacine was hunted to extinction during the 1900s, in large part because people were afraid it would have hunted their sheep. However, a new study suggests this probably isn't the case. Based on both fossil evidence and more modern specimens, it's likely that the animal would have weighed less than about 21 kilograms, or around 46 pounds. This is a threshold that's very important in mammals, as mammals above this threshold are more likely to hunt animals that are larger than themselves, and animals smaller than this threshold are more likely to only hunt smaller prey, like small rodents or other small ground-dwelling animals. What this shows is that the thylacine probably shouldn't have been hunted to extinction, as it really wouldn't have been a threat to many of these livestock herds that the farmers were bringing in to different areas of Australia and Tasmania. Instead, it was more human paranoia than actual threat that caused the extinction of the thylacine. While this is just one way that the fossil record can intersect with what happens with people, there are other ways, such as understanding the histories of certain diseases, like bone cancer which was shown to occur in dinosaurs for the first time last month. Bone cancer has been a terrible disease on many people, and because of this, the researchers specifically brought in medical doctors who work on human patients in order to understand better what was happening at the microscopic level of this tumor by using sophisticated and very complex imaging techniques in order to get a better idea of what was happening microscopically within the tumor. Now, there's a lot of detail in this paper that I don't necessarily understand because I don't necessarily research cancer. I research fossils as much as I can. And so I can't necessarily give you all the details. However, it does show that this was a very advanced stage of cancer in this animal, which was a centrosaurus, a type of ceratopsian. Additionally, it shows that the animal probably didn't die of this advanced cancer, as it was buried alongside a number of other centrosaurs, which means it probably died in something like a flood. However, it does also indicate that these rare animals were probably herd living, and that this advanced stage of cancer may have actually gone as far advanced as it was, because the animal may have been somewhat protected by this herd style living. However, more analysis on the behavior of these animals will need to be had in order to better understand whether or not this was indeed the case, as opposed to just some kind of happy coincidence that happened, where this particular animal was able to survive longer than might be expected with this debilitating disease. As for ceratopsians as a whole, they've been fairly well studied, and their ancestry is fairly well known. However, the overall clade they belong in, the Ornithischians, has been much worse understood, especially because a lot of the early fossils of this clade seem to be either missing or very, very rare. However, a new study suggests that they may not be quite as rare as we might expect, because a clade that was formerly thought to be not dinosaurs may actually be truly dinosaurs and that's the Silosaurs. They've always been very close to dinosaurs, either just very much adjacent to them as like a sister group, or slightly further removed. However, this new study again suggests that they are true dinosaurs, and in fact, the first members of the Ornithischians, and this would resolve a lot of different issues we have with the early phylogeny of the dinosaurs. Now, this new study won't necessarily resolve all of the issues that we have with the early dinosaur family tree. However, it does actually make a lot of at least intuitive sense in that we do actually have these fossils that may very well be dinosaurs. Just because of the very partial nature of many of these fossils, we didn't quite recognize it until we looked at them in more detail. And a lot of researchers have expressed ideas that this isn't necessarily controversial. It makes sense and it does solve a lot of the ideas that we would have had about this tree. Overall, it's a very interesting paper, and we still will need more fossils in order to better identify 
if this is or is not the case. And that's something that's going to take people getting out in the field and looking in Triassic rocks for more Silosaurs or other Basal Ornithischians, which is something that I will be trying to do because I really love this and I live near Petrified Forest. However, I can't necessarily do it all on my own. Another clade which established themselves in the Triassic was the Lepidosaurs, which includes both Squamata, which is all modern lizards and snakes, as well as the Mosasaurs, which did die out at the end of Cretaceous, as they do also belong to this clade, and the Rhynchocephalians, which include one living genus, the Tuatara. The Tuatara is native to only New Zealand, and its study has been very important, particularly with a recent genetic study, which has revealed a lot about how not just early lizards may have evolved, but also early mammals. Fundamentally, genomes are weird. Without specific study, it's hard to explain all the things that can occur to just a genome. However, they can often duplicate themselves, and many of these duplicate parts can be redundant. They just exist and don't really do much. And the Tutar has a lot of these, which can help us understand a lot about the very early evolution of the amniotes as a whole, which includes both mammals and the reptiles. Unfortunately for right now, the Tuatara genome is also one of the largest known, which means it's going to take a lot more study to be able to identify the specific parts of this that can relate to this kind of evolution of the early amniotes. However, it does also show that they were separated, the Rhynchocephalians at least, the Tuatara and its kin, were separated from the Squamata, the lizards, by around 250 million years ago, which is what we expected based on the fossil evidence. So while there will need to be more study done on the longer term genes that go back into the Permian and Carboniferous, there is very good evidence still that this is a very accurate study, as it does show what we would expect based on fossil evidence. Another study showed how just one genus a few million years after the Permian-Triassic extinction 250 million years ago was able to partake in what's called niche partitioning, that is, selecting different foods so that there isn't direct competition between different species. What the study showed is that there were at least two different species of Tanistrophius coming from the Bassano formation of both northern Italy and Switzerland. Tanistrophius hyboides, which was newly named by this paper, and Tanistrophius longibardicus are two different species of Tanistrophius that lived within that same formation. And they had different body types, with Tanistrophius longibardicus being significantly, significantly smaller than Hydroides. A study of the bones of Tanistrophius longibardicus shows that even though they were smaller, these animals were still adults, as well as they had different teeth, which were much more blunted and likely used for crushing soft-shelled invertebrates, such as soft-shelled crabs, which may have been evolving at that time, and if not, animals that were still similar, likely crustaceans that had softer shells as opposed to harder shells. Meanwhile, Tanistrophius hydroides was likely living in slightly deeper waters, although still not deep waters, and it was likely hunting more fast-moving prey with more narrow and pointed teeth so that it could hold on to these fast-moving prey, such as squid or fish, which would have been much more harder to grasp if they were hunted by Tanistrophius longibardicus. The main implication of this is that even by the mid-Triassic, a few tens of millions of years after the PT extinction, the most devastating extinction in history, that these animals were already developing complex food webs and partaking in different foods to avoid competition, rather than many animals trying to compete for the same food source in order to find success. Still in Triassic waters, a new study shows Quaizoichthyosaurus was probably much more of a dominant predator than we might have expected. Its teeth seemed more adapted for hunting softer prey and smaller prey. However, a new specimen was found which shows it definitely didn't just hunt smaller prey. And that's because a 5 meter long, or about 16 foot long, specimen of Guaizoichthyosaurus was shown to have an about 4 meter long torso section of a thalatosaur inside of its stomach. Well, not just its stomach. Some of it was coming out of the mouth, and the animal likely drowned trying to eat this, which means it would have been a much more voracious carnivore than we had previously expected. Now, the thalatosaur section wasn't the entirety of the animal, so the entire thing wasn't 4 meters. However, the entire animal would have been about that size, and if hunted by Guaizoichthyosaurus, would have shown that it was very comfortable hunting animals nearly its own size. Additionally, there was a tail section that was slightly separated from this fossil, and the tail section of this thalatosaur that was found is about the right size for the torso section that was found inside the mouth of this Guaizoichthyosaurus, 
which means it may have actually shaken its prey apart, somewhat like crocodiles do today. What this means is we can't just base our ideas of ichthyosaur diet solely on teeth. They may have been far more aggressive than we might have expected, hunting animals almost as large as themselves and occasionally even dying trying to eat it, because their eyes were just a little too big for their stomachs. As for animals that were based on land during the Triassic, a new study looked at Triassic vertebrates and did a full review of many of the different sites that they occur at, at least during the early Triassic. And what they found is during this time period, many temnospondyls, massive, massive amphibians, were mostly limited to the polar regions. Now, these temnospondyls would eventually reach more equatorial regions during the later Triassic, such as where they're found at Petrified Forest, which was very much an equatorial region during that time. However, they also found other things. For example, it's been proposed that there was essentially a death gap near the equator during the Permian-Triassic extinction, where it was too hot for many things to live. And while what they find does still support some evidence of this, they do also suggest some reasons why this might occur. First, the equator was mostly mountains during this time as Pangaea came together. And so that wouldn't be necessarily conducive to a lot of fossilization. As you don't need high ground, you need low ground in order to bury an animal and have it fossilize. Additionally though, they also find that this fossil gap near the equator should actually be narrowed to some degree. The initial gap was expected to be from about latitude of 30 north and 40 south. And these researchers were able to reduce it to about 15 north and 31 south. This does reduce that area, and in that area near the equator, we do see some indications that that may have been the start of many of the groups we see today. For example, the Lepidosaurs, which includes both Squamata, the lizards, and the Rhynchocephalians, such as the Tuatara, which I mentioned earlier. Additionally, there's also a good indication that this is actually closer to where the dinosaurs got their start, with this much more equatorial warm region being near where they were able to develop, as opposed to the polar regions, like the Temnospondyls were able to hold out, as the Temnospondyls were older than the Permian-Triassic extinction, and the dinosaurs aren't. The study also suggests that certain animals burrowing, such as the ancestors of Thrinaxodon, a small relative of mammals, was what led to them being able to survive the Permian-Triassic extinction, rather than them developing that ability during the extinction. Which means Thrinaxodon's ancestors would have been burrowing before the extinction, survived the extinction, and then radiated outwards into the mammals. And that's different than what would have happened if it had not had the burrowing, developed the burrowing during the extinction, and then radiated it out. It's a very small and kind of minutia detail, but helps to show that animals don't necessarily rapidly evolve during an extinction event. Instead, they rely on behaviors and traits that they've already developed in order to survive, which is something we need to keep in mind when we're looking at modern extinctions. Animals won't necessarily just develop new behaviors. They may have slightly different behaviors, but likely not anything that's going to be significant enough to allow them to survive if we continue to pollute the planet in the same way that we are currently. Another study looked at one of these behaviors that was probably very indicative of at least one of the clays that survived the Permian-Triassic extinction surviving, and that's specifically the genus Lystrosaurus. Lystrosaurus is incredibly, incredibly common in very early Triassic sediments, particularly in the Karoo Basin, where it can make up over 90 or 95% of animals that are found terrestrially in the Karoo Basin from early Triassic sediments. Lystrosaurus, as a genus, also has a very wide range, being found not just in South Africa in the Karoo Basin, but also in places like Antarctica and South America. What this means is there's a lot of different environments it lived in, and by studying the tusks the animal had, researchers were able to identify certain behaviors that occurred in this animal that would have led to them being more likely to succeed. The most specific of which is torpor. Torpor is essentially a warm time hibernation, or a subtype of hibernation. It's the way certain animals can shut down and slow down their metabolism in order to survive through very, very tough circumstances. Some animals, like hummingbirds, still do this today, where when they're very tired, they can reduce their metabolism and rest until times are more indicative and more supportive of their lifestyle, as they do need to move around very quickly. And while it's not suggested that Lystrosaurus was moving around quickly, it still would have had to go through very tough times during this extinction. And the reason the researchers are so confident in being able to suggest this behavior to Lystrosaurus is because the analysis of their tusks showed certain animals in more polar regions, which may have been either more dry or having less water, colder temperatures, less plant life, 
showing much more stress in those tusks with different growth rings that occurred. The tusks will grow throughout the animal's life. And whenever the animal experiences a very much more stressful situation, different elements will be picked up and deposited in those tusks, as well as having a, just a differential growth, which will show a much more compacted layer of that growth. This is not unlike tree rings, where a bad year for a tree will show a smaller ring rather than a wider ring where there was a lot of rain and water coming down the mountain. What this suggests is that while Lystrosaurus may have only shown it at the polar regions, at least in the fossil record, throughout different latitudes during the Permian-Triassic extinction, it may have been able to undertake torpor in order to survive the harshest conditions of the Permian-Triassic extinction. Additionally, we can look at behaviors of some of the animals that would have led to both the mammals and the reptiles, which is the amniotes, which again I mentioned earlier in the Maituatara section. What a new fossil trackway shows coming from the Monocacha formation of the Grand Canyon is an animal walking diagonally up a large sand dune. Sand dunes can form at least very certain formations, such as the Coconino sandstone, which is very famous for its huge crossbedding, which does show these dunes. The Monocacha formation isn't that dissimilar from the Coquino sandstone, though it is older, coming from the Carboniferous. What this means is we can identify the environment that the footprints came from, and while the fact that they were walking diagonally seems like a very, very minor detail that isn't important, what it does show is that the very first of the vertebrates on land were able to fairly rapidly adapt to many different environments, and develop behaviors that help them to succeed in very different environments than the more bog-like and estuary-like environments that they would have first left the water in. Looking at movement, but this time for birds and some non-avian dinosaurs, we're looking at flight, and specifically where exactly flight developed. This has been a long-standing question for many researchers, and so being able to understand this does help a lot. What the research found is that flight occurred at least four times in the dinosaur family tree at least once with animals like Yi Chi in the Scansoropterygids, once again with animals like Microraptor, very small dromaeosaurs, again with animals like Rayonavis, which were the most southern continent-based dromaeosaurs and come from South America, and then finally in the line that would lead to Aves, the birds. Additionally, this research suggests that the Anchiornids, animals like Anchiornis, were actually a split-off group of that lineage that led to birds, it's always been a little bit questioning of where to put these. Sometimes they've been placed as trudontids or dromaeosaurs. And so having another study that makes actually a lot of sense for where to place them intuitively does help to suggest that they may have actually been closer to birds than we might have thought. Especially since they do have a lot more of the bird-like characteristics, such as very advanced flight feathers and other derived feathers on the body, at least in ancient Ornus, which suggests that they were very, very invested in developing their feathers. I will also mention one of the authors of this paper did make a video abstract that is within the digital version of this paper, linked down below in Current Biology. Now we're still going to be looking at something related to movement, although this animal certainly wasn't moving after at least one injury it sustained. The animal is a very large ground sloth, which was hunted and probably killed by a very large Perosaurus nevenensis. This is one of the smaller species of Perosaurus the larger being Perosaurus brasiliensis, which could have reached potentially up to about 40 feet, which would have made it one of the largest crocodilians on record. Now, the bite on this sloth shows an animal about four meters long, or around 13 feet, taking a very good bite that would have been comparable to modern crocodilians of around the same size. The difference is, we know Perosaurus wasn't limited to the size of modern crocodilians. Again, it could reach about 40 feet long, which is somewhere a little bit over 12 meters at least. What this means is that if the bite forces of Perosaurus does scale the same way as modern crocodilians, an adult Perosaurus brasiliensis at around 40 feet long could have probably produced a bite force of around 7 tons, which would make it the strongest bite force ever measured potentially. There's a few animals like Megalodon, which may have been very close, but it's certainly at least the strongest bite force that we can fairly accurately measure in the fossil record. While Perosaurus may have been one of the largest crocodilians in history, there were also other animals that were still even larger on land, such as the Titanosaurs, some of the largest sauropods to have ever existed, if not the largest. It seems very intuitive that these animals would have come and hatched as very large babies. However, that would be incorrect. Eggs are limited by essentially how thick the shell is in order to support the egg itself, 
and how thin the shell is so that the animal can break out. Now, what's really interesting is that while the eggs of titanosaurs would have probably been about the size of a football, a new fossil has been found which shows how they might have been able to break out of a potentially thicker eggshell that would have been needed for that large of an egg. Many modern birds and reptiles have what's called an egg tooth, which falls off after a few weeks. What this is used for is to pierce the egg from the inside so that the animal can get out in a healthy and clean way. However, because the titanosaurs would have had much thicker eggshells, it seems as though they may have taken a slightly different approach from the falling off egg tooth. Specifically, with Pinocchio-like appearance, they may have actually used bone as this egg tooth, which would have helped them to pierce the much thicker eggshell of the larger football-sized titanosaur eggs. Additionally, this would have meant that the animal would have kept this egg tooth at least for some time, long enough for it to grow and develop a larger skull around what would have already been protruding outwards as this egg tooth. Now, this doesn't necessarily tell us a ton about the very young life of titanosaurs, or at least gives us some indication and some base points that we can try and compare to down the road, especially as we continue to find more fossils of different titanosaurs, and we can hopefully try to understand what exactly their life history might have been, and their ontogeny as they had developed from embryos into fully grown animals of the largest species to ever walk the land. While this very remarkable dinosaur embryo wasn't necessarily expected, there were also other fossils that weren't expected, such as the first dinosaur fossil coming from outside the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Instead, this fossil came from the Isle of Egg, which I hope I'm saying right, but I'm not Scottish, so I can't necessarily swear to it. The researchers who were in the area were looking still for fossils, however, again, not dinosaur body fossils, mostly just footprints which were known from the area. However, one of them went off to use the restroom and, on the way back, found something that they recognized as a dinosaur bone. Now, this came from a very hard sandstone, so the researchers had to very carefully cut it out of the sandstone, take it back to the lab and prepare it. And after the preparation, they were able to state that it is at least likely a stegosaur bone. However, we cannot know what species or even what genus, as it is just a single bone. However, what it does indicate is A, that there were dinosaurs very clearly here who were also dying here. Not necessarily that they were just migrating through, where there may have been less death occurring over time. Additionally, it may be the first indication that there may be more fossils to find coming from the Isle of Egg. However, that will be very hard to tell as, again, this was a very dense sandstone that the researchers had to cut this bone out of. I mean, it took a lot of effort to clean it out of it. And also, while it may be good for preserving certain fossils, it also means that it's going to take a lot of effort for natural processes to erode the fossils out of this sandstone. Meaning that there's going to be a much more rare chance of finding animals in this simply because they are not likely to show up because this is a very resilient rock. We can't know what fossils are within a specific rock area unless they are eroding out. For example, with this fossil, I showed you where it was just barely eroding out of the rock and they were able to identify it from just that. Unless you have just that much coming out again, it's not gonna be very easy to identify where these fossils are coming from. You need erosion and people there in the right time, but not too much erosion. It's a very, very stressful job trying to find fossils, is the moral of the story, because you don't want things to erode too much, but you also want them to erode a little bit so that you can try and find them. And this rock isn't inducive to erosion, which means you're going to be mostly stuck on the I hope things erode side. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I do real quick want to mention that um, there was an article on the overall geology and historical geologic study of Beers Ears National Monument. I have mentioned this in a lot of other videos. I will put links in this video to my Bears Ears stuff. There's the Donald Trump Hates Dinosaurs one, which discusses Bears Ears, and there's What's Lost at Grand Staircase and Bears Ears videos, which are some of my older videos. So if they're not up to snuff, let me know. I can try and reshoot them a little bit better. It's important to keep track of things like Bears Ears because it is formerly at least National Monument land. It has a lot of very important fossils and it should not be opened up to things like coal mining and oil shale mining because those are things that are going to ruin not just the fossils, but like we don't need more fossil fuels burning. The world's already on fire. Be safe, take care, wash your hands, wear a mask, and don't go extinct.